Hi, this is Harold. I'm here in Kashgar. It's October 10th, 2021, and I just want to give an unfiltered impression, uh, ideally uncut. I hope I don't get interrupted by a phone call or anything. I'll just keep the camera running and walk through the new old town. The new old town is inspired by the old town of Kashgar which is in the very eastern part of Xinjiang. I say inspired because the actual old town uh, was deemed unstable, dangerous in case of earthquakes. And so they rebuilt a new city, but in a style that somehow remotely resembles the old uh, Kashgar. I have seen parts of uh, the old Kashgar from the outside and I have to say it's much more spectacular than what they've rebuilt here but still um, this new old town also has a very nice feeling of of uh, I'd say Middle Eastern culture so it definitely does not feel like China despite all the China flags and the main reasons one obviously the architecture uh, the other is the language so there are, of course, quite a few uh, Han Chinese tourists who speak the Mandarin language or dialects of it, but the vast majority, at least now, uh, mid-October, is uh, local people and they speak the local Uyghur language which sounds completely different, so <laughs> it's not even related. It's uh, written in a script that resembles uh, Arab script. Let me show you here in the shop. So you see the ancient handmade English writing above the Chinese and then the Uyghur. And um, for those who know Arab, there are certain letters which don't exist in Arab. Uh, the difference is in the dots and the lines above and below um, but nonetheless the script resembles very much the Arab script and um, yeah these are some some reasons why this feels so different from anywhere else in China so myself I've learned basically the script of Arabic language um, just for curiosity because I had some work with Middle East um, I cannot write it I cannot really read it I've uh, learned a few letters I forgot of some of them um, but I can recognize the letters and um, I can recognize some that clearly do not exist in, in Arab language and I had a tea this morning with uh, in, a, in a local tea house and um, the, the, the owner was writing by hand this uh, Uyghur script. I asked him how to pronounce it. He um, said how to pronounce the word. And I asked him to type it into my phone. First, I gave him my Arab keyboard because I, I was like, yeah, you know, maybe you can type it. He was like, oh, I don't know. And then I changed the keyboard to Uyghur. So Uyghur uh, keyboards are available in Chinese phones. I have a Huawei phone, I assume all uh, Chinese phones offer Uyghur uh, script as well. And with that then he could type it. So it exists both handwritten and typed. We're here at an entrance to the old town. Beside, behind the entrance there's the... Yeah, there, you would, there's a, the mosque in the distance, the large mosque of, of Bashar. And behind that, then there's the new city. And here in this tea house, second floor, there are some musicians. And it may be very relevant to explain to people the date. So uh, the Chinese national holiday starts on October 1st and it lasts for seven or eight days. Which means until October 7th, this was a high season here for tourism. And now, obviously, uh, the holiday is over, so not, not many tourists are left. 
and it's probably also the end of the season because uh, it's getting very cold very rapidly I came here three days ago it was still okay to wear you know a light sweater or t-shirt and now within three days it's really cooled down and I'm wearing a jacket and still feeling chilly but it's nice to see with less tourists and you see in the faces a lot of people do not look Chinese at all they look uh, Middle Eastern they could be Turkish they could be uh, Jewish they could be from Israel as well or Arab um, yet obviously they are Uyghurs <laughs> like those children here <coughs> and if you have been to other places in China you know that children will always be very very guarded by lots of adults so in Beijing I often see one child with three four adults at the same time there could be like uh, you know a parent a grandparent a nanny and um, here in this tourist part of Kashgar there are lots of kids that just run around on their own and they they seem to be unattended maybe it's a benefit of this um, tourist town that it has gates at the entrance um, so it, it, it means that when you have these gates the kids won't run onto the street <laughs> and um, I just focus on this painting a bit because of the beards you'll see that nobody really has a beard anymore and we've I've been trying to find out together with another tourist uh, from the Muslim Hui minority um, we've been wondering like is it not allowed for the people to wear beards or were they just like encouraged to not or to shave the beard and, and, and now feel that it's old-fashioned as do a lot of people obviously I mean we cannot force people to wear traditional clothes just because we like to see them um, but then again we also hope obviously that people can choose to have a beard I've seen one with a long beard but it's very very rare now <laughs> these kids here having a fun time with a police officer lady and I think this police or no I, I don't just think I know I hear she's speaking in Uyghur and all the police um, that I see here they're all Uyghur people so it's not like an oppressed uh, people with uh, police coming from outside Camel obviously another tourist attraction they have uh, shows here even though the season is over they still run the show and um, also the headscarves the covering of the hair for women is not really there anymore um, I'll just try to in it not intrusively focus on this lady here with the red hairdo so she's obviously an exception with the covered hair however um, locals have told me that this style is the is the Kazakh style so she would be a Kazakh lady with the traditional Muslim hair covering whereas the Uyghur ladies that I've seen no matter old or young the older one typically wear wear a hat which both men and women wear the women have more colorful ones the men have more black and white ones and um, this typical Uyghur cap but not scarves or, or not shawls to cover the hair and again I don't know how much is, is a rule that enforces this change how much is it that people are actually liberated from from extremists who forced them to cover the hair and grow beards as we you know hear from Afghanistan and, and other places in Central Asia but what I do notice is one thing that I just mentioned the police are all made of local people love this architecture as well does have a lot of charm even though it's not as complex and um, uneven as the traditional old town was but it's still very pretty and at night they light it up to make it look beautiful 
So um, back to this topic of oppression. So one thing that I notice is the police are, all police that I see are local people, are Uyghur people. And um, by the way, for those who don't know it, police in China don't wear guns. So whenever you read of policemen recently, there was a CNN alleged interview with an alleged Chinese police officer leaving China because he did all kinds of atrocities in Xinjiang. Um, he wears this regular black uniform that says police on it. And he claims to have held a gun and stuck it against the head of people. You can tell that's a lie simply from the fact that the Chinese police do not have guns. They don't carry guns. There's only one type and they're called armed police, but that's not the regular in the black uniform. They usually wear more like a military attire and they're called armed police. Uh, so you see now they're also showing off the dresses. And the funny thing is these uh, paid actors obviously um, do this for tourists, but the children are almost a bigger attraction for me. I, I just love how they enjoy the show and they play with the camel and, and you know, dare each other how, how, how close do you want to go to the camel. <laughs> and also just feel like very connected to the older people who just um, are around. It doesn't seem like their parents are actually caring like uh, around them. It, it's more like adults care for children and children do what they like and, and run around. Obviously today is weekend. Uh, I was also wondering like how, how the holidays over, how are there so many children on the street? But yes, obviously today is a weekend. And in a way, if I think on Beijing, how, how parents worry about their children's studying and how hard they have to work and the weekend they have to take extra classes. Obviously the kids here don't take extra classes and you'd be like, how are they ever going to compete against uh, those Chinese kids from the, from the big cities in school? I mean, obviously they won't. If they make it to high school, that's a good thing. And I just hope that China and Kashgar can find a way to preserve this more relaxed lifestyle. Also the adults are much, much more relaxed than in the big cities. And um, I just feel it's a, it's a form of healthy as well. Obviously uh, you don't have the high quality medicine. You don't have the modern lifestyle of a, of a big city in China. Um, but shouldn't there be diversity? I mean, it's not up to me to judge or decide, but um, it just feels like the, the, this feeling of happiness here seems to be really high. <laughs> Although, now, just when I say happiness, the guy drives by with a very sad face, but... <laughs> Hello! Hello. <laughs> you can say English, right? No. No English. Oh,看一下。那个公主啊,对对,我刚才也拍了,很漂亮是吧?对。你长大了也要做公主吗?我我喜欢公主啊。哦。你不喜欢公主。我喜欢她。喜欢什么?她哭。她哭。加油。加油
And those kids just now, by the way, they spoke Chinese with me because uh, they all learn Chinese in school now. And they generally, from, from like five, six years onwards, they speak quite well Chinese. If they're younger than that, then usually they just speak Uyghur. So they don't learn Chinese before they get to school, but in school they all learn Chinese, which um, is very important, obviously, to to have uh, the opportunity to to go to anywhere in China, to have like this freedom of choosing their own destiny in this country. If you only know your minority language that is spoken in a very, very remote place, in the far west kind of cut off from the rest by a desert then how would you ever make it to the big cities how would you make it to the east coast how would you even travel so so to speak the national language definitely is very important you can imagine it if you're a native american in the u.s and you wouldn't learn english you would just be stuck on your own location and couldn't go anywhere So this is the alley where I'm staying. I was staying at a at a hostel here that doesn't have the permit to house foreigners. That's an annoying thing in China. Sometimes the authorities, they feel like they have to ensure a certain quality standard for foreigners. I mean, yeah, it makes somewhat sense that they say you have to have someone who speaks English to be allowed to accommodate foreigners. Then again, I speak Chinese, I don't need that. And then they make other requirements regarding, uh, you know, the, the water supply, etc. Things like, why do you decide for me? I as a foreigner can decide for myself if I want a Western standard or if I choose to go simple and really dive into local culture. But here, this is the place I stay at. And um, they, they're they really friendly people. So it's, it's a lady from Henan who invested a few years back, came here to build up a hostel, and she's hiring local people, which uh, they're required as well. So the hostels here, they're either from the local government or from, from investors. They came from, uh, from other regions of China and but they're required to hire local uyghur people they complain the uyghurs they cannot find uyghurs with a like with the working mentality of han chinese who really take ownership of of this place so they um don't really feel like these uyghurs can take over this place and this is something that will be the big challenge for the future, whether the government and whether the authorities, including the local authorities, which are mainly made up of Uyghurs as well, whether they can build up local experts and local cadres and local, um, you know, shop managers. The tea shops, the restaurants, they seem to be run fully by, by local Uyghurs, but these hostels, I mean, in a way, the tourists all come from other regions, so it helps that the, the, the managers of these hostels also know these other regions and know what the tourists want. But then again, to increase the ownership, it would of course be great if more local people also can become owners and really run the show here. And so, these are my um, impressions. So these two ladies, for comparison, they spoke Chinese, they look Chinese as well. These obviously are Chinese tourists. And yeah, these are my impressions from Kashgar on October 10th, 2021. As I said, there are challenges here, definitely in terms of development, in terms of local ownership. There's also a lot of positivity in the air, happy children on the roads. Uh, police, yes, a lot of police, but very relaxed. As I speak, there's two more walking by there. And a lot of it is job creation program. The government has a reason to give the money by employing them as policemen, um, unarmed police, so not threatening to anyone. And yeah, that was my walk through the tourist area. I have walked to another area, but I didn't film that, so 
maybe I'll do that on another day. Thanks for watching and if you liked it please give it a like.